Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and today we're speaking with Jill Valdez. Leadership is bringing out the best in the people you are responsible for. Jill has been unearthing the best of people for over 19 years. A majority of those years were as an executive at nonprofit organizations. Her desire to see more companies focus on improved employee engagement compelled Jill to return to college and complete a master's in industrial organizational psychology. Jill Valdez strives to make the people around her better through her leadership. She enjoys assisting others in discovering that they are leaders and coaching them through the process of leadership development. Today, she does that through her consulting agency, LINK, an agency she started in August 2018 to help companies improve people management to achieve what's next now. Welcome, Jill Valdez. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. We're so happy to have you on our podcast. So are you ready to pour into our listeners? I am so ready. Thank you. Great. So Jill, can you tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now? Sure. For many years, I actually didn't even consider myself as a leader. I didn't think that I qualified for that. Growing up, I was the middle child. So my brother was always the leader of the siblings. I always had a boss or an employee or somebody with longer tenure to be the leader at work. Even after having kids, I didn't consider myself a leader. I was just being a mom. But then one day my husband brought home this book and it was very popular amongst his peers. And it was the 21 irrefutable (laughs) laws of leadership, right? That kind of changed everything for so Mm -hmm. many people. Along with hundreds of other pastors, I was awakened to this awareness of how much of a leader I already was. So I began the pursuit of developing into being the best leader that I could be. And it's been a journey, but I am a leader and I strive to make people around me better through leadership. I super much enjoy assisting others in discovering that they're leaders and coaching them through the process of leadership development. So now, I'm helping companies improve their people management in order to propel their organization. I'm showing like small business owners and managers of mid-sized businesses how to get the best from and give the best to their team, which ultimately is the core of leadership. You gave us some clues about this, but how would you describe your leadership? (laughs) Oh, well, I have to say first and foremost, it's always improving, Mm -hmm. but I consider myself a value-based leader. I recently wrote a paper about leadership and there was an article I read by John Frost and he says that value-based leadership consists of leading self, leading others, and leading an organization. He says it directs our choices and elevates our imprint on people's lives. And that's what I want Mm -hmm. Um, as a leader, being driven by my values, as opposed to my emotions or even what's happening in the business world, I want to be driven by my values. We know that leading by emotions can lead us astray. Yeah, so much so. You mentioned a paper. Tell us about your paper. Well, I recently finished my master's degree in psychology. Part of my journey was discovering that what I did for 18 years in the nonprofit sector was a very valuable service to bring to the for-profit sector and wanting to do that more and getting into that. And again, wanting to improve myself, I went back to school and I got my master's degree in industrial organizational psychology. And from that, it was writing a lot of papers. I wrote a lot of papers. Yes, we know about (laughs) that. Also, you mentioned one of my favorite books, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. I'm just curious. You know John Maxwell. I do. John Maxwell, he actually got started as a pastor. That's what he was in his former life, right? And when he was at his church, my husband was a youth pastor in the same area. And so we were aware of who he was. And then he started coming out with these books. And we're like, 
hey, that's that pastor guy from down the street. <laughs> it's right there. That's right yeah. There. So can you tell us, Jill, which quote or quotes speak to your life and why? There's two that really stick out to me the most, and I'm probably going to get a little <laughs> emotional. There was a movie that came out called We Bought a Zoo. Fun little family movie. And in it, he's sitting down and he's talking to his son. And his son is just trying to figure out kind of what the next step is to further this relationship. And the dad looks at me and says, you know, sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. Just 20 seconds of embarrassing bravery. And I promise you, something great will come of it. And I wish that people would be willing to take that chance to just take 20 seconds of insane courage and watch how their life changes. I tend to jump into things and I think about it, but there's some things that I do think about and I still want to take that chance anyway, because I don't want to ever look back on my life and say, oh, I wish I would have done that. So you're and a risk taker. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> doesn't sound like a little bit. Sounds like a lot of it. I know that as I have stepped out and as I've encouraged people to take that 20 seconds of insane courage, not worrying about what anybody else is going to think about you. And again, lining it up with your values, but knowing that it's going to be something that is going to probably change your life and probably change the lives of those around you. When I do corporate retreats, I close the whole retreat with that clip. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for about 10 years and I still just get so emotional every time. It's just 20 seconds of insane courage. You know, and as you're speaking, um, I'm writing some words down that jump out at me about your leadership style. And you did speak on this, but it's clear that you empower others and you value others so much and you see something in them that they may perhaps not see in themselves. Yeah. So often we get stuck. People can get very stuck inside their own head and not see the good inside of them or the potential inside of them. Mm -hmm. I love just drawing that out of people. I'm working with a client right now and man, she's a manager and her team cannot stand her. Mm -hmm. Some of it is that they didn't understand her. She's similar to me. She's super driven, type A personality, and her team is completely the opposite. And she doesn't know how to work with them. They don't know how to work with her. But I've seen so much potential in her. And as we've been working over the last few months to watch her change and to watch her get how to be a better manager and then to see her team respond to it, it's been so exciting to watch that. I believe that there's good in everybody and to be able to mine that out of them, help them embrace that, and then help them understand how to project that better. I love doing that. And I know that that took work because I know as human beings, humanity, we tend to look at the negative. But the fact that you look at the positive first, I know that that's work on your part. So thank you so much for that. Now, Jill, Tell us about a leader who inspires you. Mm. I had a very, very good friend. Her name is Sherry Benvenuti, and probably nobody's ever heard of her. She was a professor at a local university, and she was a speaker. And so I had the opportunity to listen to her. And from that, we became very good friends. She had such passion and a drive to live her life on purpose. And mm. I always would joke with her. I'm like, I want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> she so selflessly poured into other people and knew exactly who she was, knew exactly what she was supposed to be doing. And everything that she did was about that. She passed away a few years ago. She fought cancer really hard, but she did pass away. But she has definitely inspired me as a leader. When you mentioned someone who knew who she was, to me, it's someone who is comfortable with who they are. And that's pretty powerful to be in that space. Yes, totally agree. Now, Jill, I asked of every person, and it may be a selfish motive, but I'm <laughs> really good advice. What's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, that's simple. It's take action. Somebody told me one day, just do it. 
And that may seem surprising to people who know me or even your listeners. The assumption is, is I'm just always going. And of course I take action, but there's a lot of times where I get very paralyzed and don't know what to do. And so I'll just not do anything where the deception can come in is I'll find something else to do. So it looks like I'm doing stuff, but, but for me to take action on what I'm moving towards and it doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, I should expect that it's not perfect, but at least do something to take a step towards that goal. Take action. I love that. You know, I can relate because I do take action, but you're right. There are times when I can be afraid to take action in one area and I'll take action in another. I appreciate that. That's new insight for me. Yeah. So, Jill, I know you work with a lot of organizations and you build teams. Yes. What does it mean to you to have a good team and how do you build and sustain one? Well, a good team, I mean, that's the difference between success and failure, in my opinion. If you don't have a good team, then you're either going to be doing it all or you're going to be doing nothing. And so it's vital. It's absolutely critical to have a good team, to build a good team. Really, that's what I've committed myself to helping companies do. You build a good team by recognizing that your team is made up of humans. And these are people that want to make a contribution. They may be an employee, it may be a volunteer team, but regardless of why they're there or what has brought them to that place and brought them to be a part of that team, they're there because they want to make a contribution. Uh, you build a good team by learning about each other's strengths and weaknesses. You learn about their passions and then you let your team members operate in those strengths. Let them do what they're really good at. Let them do what fuels them, what, what gives them purpose and meaning. Because it's more than likely that something like one team member is really, really good at, another team member is not. Or something that another team member is really passionate about that there may be a team member going, oh, thank God, because I hate doing that. Right. So letting your team live with the purpose and the passion of their strengths. So as a leader, let's say of a team, we have as a team a goal or a project to complete. So what you're saying is to learn about the strengths and challenges of our team members and then set this before them and they select what they want to do. That's a part of it. There's such a concentration now on being a collaborative leader, which mm -hmm. I love that we're taking leadership to be less of a one person's a leader and nobody else gets to have any input. But there's times where that's not practical. And that comes then where the leader knows their people mm -hmm. and says, okay, we've got this project. I know that John is really good with spreadsheets. And I know that Susie's really good with presentation. Then coming together and saying, okay, here's the project. These are the pieces. This is who I think would be best at doing those things. And then asking for feedback or like you said, sitting down and saying, okay, guys, this is the project. These are the pieces. This is what I think. What do you guys think? Is, or is there anything of this project that you're like, yes, I want to try that. Now, tell us about your organization and how we can reach you. So Link is a company that is about helping other companies develop and improve their people management mm -hmm. so that their company can be propelled to the next level. And I call it the next now, that dream place that you've always dreamed of getting to it now. But that through a process of consulting and training and one-on-one -on -one coaching, I help typically small business owners and managers of mid-sized companies who are doing human resources and doing people management. It's not in their wheelhouse. It's not necessarily even in their job description, but just because of their role, they're kind of having to do that. And I help them by taking some of that stuff off their plate and also by showing them little things that they can do um, to help with employee engagement, getting the most out of their team. And so the best way for your listeners to get a hold of me is to take their phone out, open up their messaging app, and text the word LINK, 
L-I-N-K, which is the name of my company, to 31996. Perfect. Now, do you have a website? I do. It's aspirationalsolutions.life. Hey, leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. Let's talk about the leadership game. Here are some of the things that you and your team will experience while playing. Team building, using a fun and engaging tool. The leadership game is a board game that allows everyone to gather around the table. Open sharing and communication. Every question and discussion card is designed to trigger open, honest feedback. Leadership skills assessment. The game challenges your team members to embrace who they are as leaders and stronger relationships. By the end of the game, team members will learn to appreciate one another and forge stronger relationships, a winning edge for any organization. So go to masterleadership.org forward slash TLG and find out how to bring the leadership game to your organization. Now, Jill, can you tell us about a challenge that you've experienced and how it shaped your life? Yes. I was at an organization for nine and a half years, and it was an extremely challenging place. Uh, When I first started there, it seemed like this was going to be a really great fit. They were an established organization. They said they wanted to move forward. They wanted to start changing. They wanted to change their culture. They wanted to be effective in actually achieving their goals. And they were thrilled to hear that I was going to be a leader there because for so many years, they'd had a leader that was a hundred percent opposite of me. So, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, this is great. But it didn't take long for them to figure out or maybe to decide that what they said they wanted and what they really wanted were not in alignment. So it was really a struggle to be there most days. There were some really good people there who were trying to stay true to what they said they wanted. They were trying to implement strategies, but overall the culture was that they really didn't want to change. Mm -hmm. And so those good people would get super discouraged and they would leave. And I couldn't blame them. I mean, their taste, I'm like, oh, do I have to go into work? But then there came a point where the company could no longer afford to have staff. So then obviously I wasn't there anymore and I had to get another job. And I decided at that point to completely shift industries. And in doing so, that has got me to where I'm at now because it was then that I discovered that all the things that I had been doing for so many years in this nonprofit sector was actually not as developed as I thought it would be in the for-profit sector. And that's what brought me to where I'm at now. And so what type of nonprofit organization did you work for? I was an executive pastor for churches. So one of them was a church plant. We started a church and that was a lot of fun. We started with five people, which was me, my husband, and our three kids. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And just putting everything into place and developing the systems and the processes and the people. And then this last one was an established church. Mm -hmm. And again, it was coming in and looking at their processes and making improvements and volunteer management and helping them with that. Yeah. Leading people is a challenge in any organization. And, you know, I was part of a nonprofit as well, so I can relate, you know, people want to change, but there's also the inner voice And there's also the limited beliefs and thinking that really drive people. And sometimes those cultures, those difficult cultures have deeper roots than we initially thought. That's a narrative that a lot of us have experienced, but this is what helps us to change and shift. So thank you so much. You're welcome. You know, and the thing is too, is it does happen. And yet we tend to not want to talk about that stuff. And this is where we talk about it. This is why why we grow. This is where we master leadership. And, and that's a verb. It's not that we're masters of leadership. Yes. All right. All right. So can you tell us about one of your greatest successes? Oh, well, my kids, of course. Come on, tell us. (laughs) They're amazing. We have three adult children at this point. I mean, we're not having any more, but they're all adults (laughs) now in life. 
it's so exciting to see all the things that we've invested in them and to see them now living their life and getting to see some of the fruit of what we've poured into them and the things that we've taught them and how they take that and make it their own and go even further with it than we had ever dreamed. So yeah, my kids are definitely my greatest success. That's a great answer because that's part of your legacy, right? It is. It really is. Wonderful. Now, Jill, many leaders describe themselves as lifelong learners. What does that mean to you and what are you learning now? So being a lifelong learner means to me that there's never a place where I have fully arrived and can't learn something. There's lessons in everything that we do. And as long as there's still breath in our body, we should be looking for what is it that I can learn from this day or from this experience um, or from this encounter or from this person. And as far as what I'm learning right now, I'm learning about marketing in growing my business and being the only person I have to market. I'm good at what I do and I love what I'm doing, but if nobody's heard of me, then it really doesn't matter. So I'm learning about how to tell people about the transformation they experience. And I'm also continuing to learn just about what's happening in the business world today. It is shifting and changing so rapidly. It can make some people feel like it's just this runaway train and they're just kind of holding on to the caboose at the end and flying off at the end, right? I know that feeling and occasionally I have to just stop and stop reading and stop listening <laughs> and just be because it's so fast. Yeah. That's really a great point, Lily, about sometimes just stopping and being in what mm -hmm. you're doing, in what you've learned. Yeah, that's really a great point. It can get a little overwhelming and feeling like you're missing out. Yeah. And there's so many channels now of where we can get this information that we could almost just become a total information overload. Right. Thank you so much for that. Now, if there were something you could change in education, what would that be? Wow, that is such a great question. I would say let's ensure that educators are still passionate about what they're teaching. You can tell when they're very passionate about what they're teaching and when they're there because it used to be that they loved it and now they're just doing it for a paycheck. If you're an educator, making sure that you are still passionate about what you're teaching. And if you've lost that passion, go discover what it was that you were drawn mm. to about that subject in the first place and fall in love with it again. What would you tell leaders of teachers who see that some of their teachers have lost their passion? What could they do? They could sit down with that educator, with that teacher, and ask them the questions draw out of them what it was about that subject that that teacher was first drawn to and help them discover again and fall in love again with that subject. You know, and that's one of the challenges that we're having too is because things are changing so rapidly, you know, shifting the traditional way that we do things. It's a slow go. You have this big shift that you're trying to steer in a different direction. And so it takes all of us collectively working together towards that. So thank you so much, Jill. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm definitely honored to be able to speak into your listeners' lives. Now, Jill, what have you read, watched, or listened to that our listeners should as well and why? I always encourage people to watch The West Wing. It's on Netflix. That's an oldie but goodie. <laughs> it is. So The West Wing really has some great opportunity for people to learn about leadership, about team dynamics, about conflict resolution. There's some major leadership points that you can get out of that. Plus it's super entertaining TV. It was so cutting edge back then. So definitely that. And then as far as reading, I love to read. And there's two books I would recommend. The first one is The One Thing by Simon Sinek, talking about staying on purpose, but making sure that it's this one thing as opposed to getting so wrapped up in all these different things that you kind of get lost. The other one is called Sway by Amber McCree Turner. I found it by accident a long time ago. I read it every year and it reminds me about imagination and it reminds me about the fact that people can be anything 
that they believe they can be. You touched on imagination, which I think we don't value that gift enough, but we've been gifted with imagination and we seldom use it. Yeah, we have to dream. One of the things that I ask people, whether they're clients or whether I've just met them or whatever, what is that dream for you? If we're talking a year from now and you're living the dream, what does that look like? And what does that possibly be? Because if we're not dreaming, we have nothing that we're moving towards. The thing about dreaming where I think we've gotten a little stuck sometimes is that I've seen so many people want to dream. And yet they frame it under what their current reality is. But dreaming is all obstacles are removed. There's no barriers. There's no even reality that has to be a part of it just in dreaming because you're just letting your imagination go wild. It doesn't mean that you have to act on that or that that becomes your reality, but it's super good to just go so far out there, you know, put that childlike wonder on and go, oh. What could my life be if? So well said. Thank you. Now, Jill, you have a lot of responsibilities. What do you do on a daily basis to set your mind? I start with coffee. It's a good start. (laughs) To get my mind awake. And then I have a time of spiritual reading and prayer and meditation. And really, that gets my mind set. And then I look at my calendar and I start thinking about and kind of envisioning what I hope the day will look like when it's the end of the day and I'm looking back and then kind of formulating a plan to make that happen going forward. That sounds like a great plan to me. And I ask this because I think it's so important to set our minds and not just be victims of our schedule or the things that occur during the day. Oh, you're so right. People tell me, I can't do that because I don't have time to do that. And what I tell them to do is to create their ideal week calendar. You know, just get a blank calendar, a blank week, whether you do that on iCal or whether you do that on a sheet of paper, whatever, and then calendar your priorities Mm -hmm. and then make everything else fit in around that. That's really good advice. All right. So Jill, if you were to go back in time, What advice would you give the younger you about leadership? I would say you're a leader, whether you have the title or not. There were a lot of instances that I look back in my life where there's probably more I could have done and contributed, but I didn't have the title. And so I felt like I couldn't be a leader. And yet that's not true. The title doesn't make you a leader. Right. And we learned that from the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And one of the biggest takeaways was that leadership is about influence, nothing more, nothing less. Yes. And John Maxwell talks about, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this, the five levels of leadership. The lowest level is that you're leading from your position, but the higher levels of leadership are about action and behavior, not the title. And what a position does, at the very least, it gives you time to develop your leadership. So take advantage of that. So even if you just got a new position as a leader and you don't know how to start, I would (laughs) urge you to get this book. But also work on you, work on developing your leadership skills, because it's just adding value to the people you lead. So that's important. All right. So Jill, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, kind of dovetailing off of what you just said about like for the new managers and the new leaders, I found that so often managers and owners and presidents and leaders, they think that they're supposed to have all the answers Mm -hmm. and yet they don't. And when they get stuck and they're afraid to turn for help or they don't know where to turn for help. So the first thing I would say is, Don't be afraid of not having all the answers. Andy Stanley says repeatedly that when he's in a room with other leaders, when he's in the room with his staff, he recognizes that he's not the smartest person in the room and he doesn't have to be. When a leader feels stuck and they don't know what to do, I would encourage them to ask these two questions. Number one is, imagine having a dialogue with the wisest person you can think of what would they tell you to do? And the other question to ask is, imagine your good friend comes to you with a problem that you've described to me, what would you tell them to do? 
you know, there it is. You're using imagination again, which is extremely valuable. And I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much for adding value to me, Jill, and to our listeners. Oh, Lily, thank you so much for letting me be on the show and to be able to speak into your leaders. And I hope that they will walk away from this and that they'll sit down and think and dream and then take 20 seconds of insane courage to put those dreams in place. Perfect. Have an amazing day, Jill. Thank you. You too, Lily. Hello, leaders. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.